Several militant groups in the region are angry with the federal government for leaving them out of the juicy contract and are now calling for immediate review to accommodate everyone talking about the 40 billion Naira uh, oil surveillance uh, or pipeline surveillance contract. Now, they are threatening to make the contract unworkable. However, the Jaw National Conf uh, Congress stepped into the matter with the president of the group, Professor Benjamin Okaba setting up a five-member committee to interface with stakeholders in order to forestall any trouble. Some militants under the ages of third-phase ex-agitators leaders yesterday demanded a review of the contract awarded to Tom Polo with a view of accommodating other ex-agitators. They also called for a meeting with Tom Polo and other relevant authorities, especially with the third phase ex-agitators leaders to ensure proper security of the pipelines and all facilities in the Niger Delta region. If not, they say it will fail. Well, joining us to discuss this is Dennis Amakri. He's a security consultant and a former assistant director of the DSS. Thank you so much, Mr. Macri, for joining us. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Great. Let's start by looking at the morale behind um, this contract that was awarded to government Ekompolo, a.k.a. Tom Polo. I'd like to let you know that as we speak right now, if you go to EFCC's website, he's a wanted felon. He has two bench warrants. Um, and, and this is the guy that the federal government chose to award a 40 billion naira contract to secure our oil installations. Of course, several others are querying this. So let's start by looking at what's the idea behind this. Well, you know, it is... Um a situation where the federal government is trying to look for solutions. And then sometimes uh, these solutions are not well prioritized. Uh, I was in the oil industry for so many years, and uh, we've always advised government, go ahead and take care of the Niger Delta. That way, no militant group or any tier of militants will come around to say that, oh, uh, we want our money or it's our turn to have our own and stuff like that. Mm. Because you remember when the militancy was very high, especially in 2006, you know, and um, the, the president at that time, our oil dropped all the way from 2.5 million barrels a day to about 600 million, uh, 600,000 a day. So the country was losing money. And they have to talk to these militants. And they actually went ahead and did it. And uh, thanks to former president, uh, Yara, late president Yara Dua, and the amnesty was given, which showed up the uh, um, production of oil. But we discovered that the militants that were giving this money were the top guys, mm. you know, the top guys of which Tom Polo was one of them, you know, and there is a second tier of militants, you know, just like a hierarchy. Second, now they are calling themselves a third tier or third phase mm. of militants. These guys had the short end of the stick where they feel that more should come to them and it wasn't. And now, because they've lived with that uh, uh, scarcity, another contract has been given again. And they felt that, no, this time, you either come down and share it with us, or, you know, we we'll make it ungovernable for you to operate. Hmm. Um, now, because as a result of this, you know, um, um, over 48 billion um, Naira contract, a group of northern um, young persons have come out to say that uh, they're going to occupy the NNPC in Abuja, of course. Uh, and they were quoted to say that if government is able to give the, a former militant this amount of money um, to surveil our pipelines, which might be a good thing, um, they're also saying that they're at, this is what they're saying, that they need monies to be given to 
um, you know, machinery so that they could come and put an end to the banditry in the north. Now, let's, let's address that issue. You're a security person. Um, these two issues placed side by side. Um, can we say that they're two of the same kinds of things? And, and really, they, they ask, is it too much? Uh, the the Arawa um, coalition something something that are you know are asking for these uh, priorities are misplaced, misplaced totally misplaced. I think they just want to be recognized. Uh, but be that as it may, you know if what they are saying is that militants can talk to militants, then of course ah go around up there and many people have uh, you know agitated that government should talk to go around fine and um, uh, you know government can go that route by discussing with them and find out how they can solve that problem you know which has taken so many years to solve now at the same time when they are going to an npc uh, to do what to bring oil money to give to them too or what? They remember the agitations in the Niger Delta was not just banditry. It was not banditry, it was not terrorism. It was, you know, people act, asking for a fair share of what is being taken away from their place. And then, of course, if you go today, like I said earlier, the environment in the Niger Delta is bad. Many farmers or fishermen cannot go fishing. And this is what government should do instead of throwing money at militants who are just, you know, most of the people that are agitated that they, they want Tompolo to, uh, they cannot allow Tompolo, is because they feel that it is money they can just take and share and eat, you know. But the problem of the Niger Delta remains. And that's why Tompolo himself has to be very, very careful in handling this particular problem. Mm. Let's talk about the, I mean, there are many people that are making a case here. Men, like I said, it's a row of sorts. Um, as we speak, resident doctors are about to go on a strike. We hear that resident doctors in Abia State have been on strike for one year. I'm wondering what the health sector in that state looks like right now. Um, also, ASU is still on strike. They've continued, in fact, as we speak. The update is they've continued this strike because there's been a deadlock between them and the government. How much are they asking for? Uh, about a, some, a one point something trillion naira. Um, again, of course, there's that deadlock with the IPI, IPPIS. That's on the one hand. The economy doesn't look so great as we speak. Um, but then we do have security votes running in billions going to states even though it's shrouded in so much secrecy. But we also heard today that local government um, officials are pocketing these monies. The president of the Federal Republic recently sent away two governors saying that, why do you come to me to ask for help when you have security votes? There are other issues of insecurity, the economy, different sectors that are ailing. And one would wonder, why are these oil installations such a critical thing at this time as opposed to the lives of people who are being lost daily to banditry, to kidnapping, to insecurity, and of course, an almost half past dead health sector. Uh, well, you know that um, oil, or crude oil, so to say, is the lifeline, is the economic lifeline of this country. You know, so whether the doctors are leaving the country, or schools are closed, or whatever, uh, the government has found it uh, convenient that uh, at least if they secure the pipeline, as long as the oil flows, and that will be no problem. The money will come in. But like I said, these are misplaced priorities. You know, these pipelines, some of them are very old. Some of them have been installed for years and years. Some of them are rusted, they bust by themselves. And then, of course, they despoil the environment in which they are passing through. So, you know, I to put our priorities right by taking care of all these things, change the pipelines if possible, or make the oil companies to change them, you know. And then, of course, 
make sure that you take care of all those people who are around the area where the pipelines are crisscrossing themselves. And then, of course, no militant will come around and say, oh, um, uh, we want it because uh, we cannot control our resources. Mm. Let's talk about the, um, so during the NBA conference, it just concluded one um, last week, Monday, um, the Social Democratic Party uh, presidential candidate, Adebayo, made a very interesting uh, statement about all theft in the country. Now, he did, in not so many words, say that government was complicit in the amount of crude that is being stolen from this country and shipped out right under the noses of our security agents, our border control, and of course, the guys who are supposed to be um, protecting these oil installations. Um, and so this has also, on the other hand, stared the waters. Um, so I want, to want, I want to ask, now that we have this 48 plus billion Naira contract, will it in any way check the amount of crude oil that is being still taken out of this country, sold outside of this country, the funds also staying outside of the country, not being repatriated into the country. Again, I'm curious to understand um, where all our security agents are. I'm talking about the military, I'm talking about the police and all of the installations in the Niger Delta, around where these oil installations are. Is the federal government telling us that these security agents are incapable of doing the job, hence we need militants? Um, well, I can tell you one thing for sure, because I was in that uh, environment when I was consulting for some oil companies. There are two major issues, and that's the one that, um, the, the first one is oil bunkering and, uh, you know, uh, pipeline vandalization. That is one small aspect of the whole thing. And, of course, through pipeline vandalization, uh, there is extra crude that is coming out and despoiling the environment. And, you know, um, we have uh, a lot of uh, uh, community people agitating because uh, they can see that their source of livelihood is gone. That is first one. Oil bunkering. Killing of oil and selling it. Now, where real stealing takes place is what we call hydrocarbon accounting. Hydrocarbon accounting. And I wish, you know, agencies like the DSS should focus on this properly because I can tell you that that's where the majority of the oil is being stolen. Stolen not by even these local boys, stolen by the international oil company, you know, on a daily basis. Because when you find out, you know, we really don't know how many barrels of oil is produced in Nigeria and how many barrels of oil is being shipped out of this country. Yes, I think the DSS should look at that. Look at it very, very carefully. Why should, the, why, sh why should it be the job of just the DSS? We have the NMPC now that it's, it's a PLC. They're supposed to be saddled I, with that responsibility. I can, you, I can tell you that I don't trust. I can tell you that I don't trust the NFC or the other subsidiaries of DPR or NAPIMS or whoever. Because apparently some people are getting rich, fatly rich in those uh, agencies. That's why either the EFCC, DSS, should look strongly into this hydrocarbon accounting. You know, how much oil are we producing? How much oil is being exported from Nigeria? Because that's where the majority, you know, still is going on. It is not those uh, pipeline busting uh, youths that filled up the three million uh, barrels of oil uh, tank that was recently arrested that 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 was that was uh, not just uh, breaking pipelines and filling it up because to fill up a tanker like that with 300 million barrels is something that you know if it is from pipeline busting it will take months and months but this was it you know where they actually pump it into that 
And then, of course, thanks to the Navy for capturing that and bringing them back to Nigeria. If you do a thorough investigation, they will find out those people who are involved in it and who. It's a syndicate. And I think, uh, I think the security agency should look at it very well. And everything that you said, it, it still comes down to, I mean, that's what I think I hear. The government is complicit. This, this amount of crude cannot be stolen without an insider. Secondly, let's talk about the refineries. Um, so we do have refineries that don't work, but we're using billions to service those refineries every single year. And I'm thinking to myself, what sense is in that? We're paying salaries to people who are working in a refinery that is not in any way producing anything. And we are taking monies to export this crude, and we use our monies again to buy it back. So, I mean, what exactly, like you started, you said this is our mainstay. Why are we so nonchalant about tightening all the loose ends around the same mainstay if we really are serious about it? I think we have uh, the major animal in the house, you know, which is corruption. Corruption is there, you know, bulldozing is all over the place. And of course, uh, there is complicity that goes on. And of course, people will fail to address it. The president has come out to say, look, he set up a, a tax force you know, to go down to the Niger Delta and find out more about crude theft. And of course, we've not heard anything much about that uh, uh, committee and what has happened, you know. And uh, people are not aware of many things that will happen. So uh, I think uh, such life turn around, you know, follow the direction of the president and then of course, Go to the bottom of why we are still losing this amount. We are not meeting OPEC quotas. We are not. And now OPEC is even raising quota for us to fill up, but we are not because a lot of it is frittered away by either you know this uh, accounting theft uh, tips or um, uh, other local bunkering. Mm. Let's talk about measures, deterrence that can be put in place. And, and, and when, when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about on all fronts, for all concerns, whether they be bunkers, whether they be IOCs, whether they be security agents or even border control, what sort of measures need to be put in place so that maybe, let's use the Nigerian way of saying it, hedge roll, uh, people go down for it, maybe that might be a deterrent, but what needs to be done for that to happen? Uh, well, I think um, the procedures and the standards have to be tightened up. They have to tighten it up, starting from an MPC. Tighten it up. And then, of course, the rules and the procedures that are given to the international oil companies must also be tightened up. Because things they cannot do in foreign countries do in our place and get away with it. Because they strongly that they can bribe one or two officials and nothing will happen. You remember when BP blew up in the Gulf of, uh, Gulf of Mexico and the whole place was destroyed. Thousands of crude oil uh, barrels were, you know, poured into the Gulf and then of course uh, it affected aquatic agencies, uh, aquatic uh, lives and then of course that affected also restaurants, it affected the tourism industry. And the government of the United States was quick to move in there. Mm. And they made them to bring it back to normal, bring it back to the original state where you can look into the water and see the pebbles on the coast. And they did it. When it happens in Nigeria, it's like, Oh, we are not going to do it because our MD knows somebody in government or you know somebody in MPC, and nothing happens because when you look at it, Ogoni clean up is still staggering.
Nobody. They still not the kill the dog till also now. Campaigned upon. He used the Ogoni cleanup as part of his campaign, and it's it's incredible that you even remembered that. It's I don't know if it's staggering. I think it's still asleep. We're, we're, we're yet to deal it with. It is staggering. The I know that. I know that some cleaners went in there, and then they did some job, but that is taking too long. How long are you going to do that? You know, it's staggering. That's why I said it's staggering. And then you, when you go to other areas in the Niger Delta, fishermen cannot fish anymore. That kinds of boats cannot go offshore, you know, to go and fish and come back because. The local areas, the rivers, are all polluted. So these are the things. And these people will continue to agitate as long as we play games with it. Now we are talking about a uh, uh, 48 billion uh, contract to Tompolo. I hope that Tompolo is going to take it more as a business venture. You know, as a business venture, get all the people involved, the state, get them involved. And then, of course, because, you know, in that area, I'm not saying you want to just take money and eat, because there are people whose livelihood now depends on concrete, whose livelihood depends on you know, running around inside the pipeline, doing whatever they like. So you are going to secure the pipeline. The first step is to make sure you involve all these people in such a way that they will forget, they will forget busting the pipelines, and then of course they will have a livelihood while they protect the pipeline. I think that's the best thing to do. I'm surprised, Mr. Maki, Mr. that you you are hoping that um, Tom Polo um, would would take it seriously. I'm sorry, but I I I find it very ridiculous that a wanted felon, uh, a one-time militant, would be we would hope that automatically this person would be a man of honor. It's, it's ridiculous. It's like the federal government saying, oh, the terrorist whose wife we flew to um, a great hospital to give birth and take care of their family, you know, didn't, didn't hold up his own side of the bargain. How do you expect a terrorist to be an honorable person? And I'm not in any way saying that Tom Polo is a terrorist, but I'm saying, why should we be in hoping? Niger, uh, Delta, in Niger Delta, they will tell you that. Uh, and I don't think Tombolo sees himself as a terrorist. I think he sees no, 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 I didn't say he was a terrorist. I'm saying it seemed, I'm just trying to place it side by side. Um, if yes, this yes. is a wanted yeah, felon, gonna... why would you hope that he would, you know, be honorable? Yes, I'm going to tell you, because that is what they fought for. You know, and that's why you find out that when other people outside the region will call them terrorists, you know, most of the time, the government have already understood that whereby they, have, they went ahead and give them amnesty. You know, when they give somebody amnesty, that means they pardoned you uh, with all the former crimes that you've committed. And then, of course, theirs was committed because they were trying to look for a better life for their people. Okay. So no problem. If he's given the contract, you know, I hope that he will handle it like a businessman you know, I use uh, specialized ideas okay. in, in handling it and then successfully. All right. His measure of success will come when you when there are no more pipeline customs. Okay. Of course, the oil is flowing freely. Well, Dennis Macri is a security consultant and a former assistant director with the DSS. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure to speak with you, Mr. Macri. Thank you for having me. All right. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you for being part of the conversation. That's the show tonight. But before we go, I will give you my take. Now, the art of a deal is an essential asset that we should all want in our leaders. The truth of our differing wants and needs as a citizenry means that our leaders, if truly representing our interests, must be capable and willing to compromise for our sake. Making the tough choices in leadership is a burden only an exceptional few are capable of carrying. Well, I hope that we have those types of leaders in Nigeria. I'm Mary Anakal. Have a great day.